After all, it's a little bit like playing Lego, right? So we have seen how terms are constructed, then how atoms are constructed, then how literals are constructed, and now we are ready to build rules from them. So in Gringo, in the very general case, a rule is composed of a conjunction of literals in the body and a disjunction of literals in the head. So the restriction, however, is that uh, the elements in the head, that is from 1 to m, are restricted to conditional literals, while the elements in the body can be arbitrary literals, so conditional literals, which include plain literals or simple literals, plus aggregate literals. So aggregates in this format are only allowed in the body of the rule. And in fact, internal translations happen more or less, and these things are then uh, achieved. And keep in mind what, what we've seen in the very first section, how, for instance, choice rules can be compiled away, right? Or, or, or aggregates in the head can be compiled to the body, right? So you all, you all know it. But anyway, this is the basic syntax. And there are some intricacies with that. So for instance, you are allowed to use semicolons uh, also here instead of commas, in particular, when one of these um, literals here is a conditional literal, why that? Well, look at the look at the example, and then it become and then I'd say it becomes crystal clear. So here we ha we have a rule, and this rule has two literals in the body. The first one is a conditional literal, b of x if c of x and d of x. So this is one literal. This is a conditional literal, and this is the second one, e of x. Now conditional literals have a condition and in this condition you already use the comma to separate the conjoins of the conjunction right so and if you would use a comma here then you would actually read this as a single conditional literal with three conditions but no what you want to express is a conditional literal where the the atom here is conditioned by two other atoms and then here there is the second body literal the second body atom if you like and there you have to use a semicolon to make clear that the condition actually ends here. And this is why Klingo allows you in the body to use both commas or semicolons and it's exactly for this where it matters. There you have to use you have to use a semicolon instead of a comma to denote an end because otherwise the system wouldn't know when the condition of the conditional literal would terminate. Okay so as a consequence, and actually some people do that, they just use semicolons all over the place. And uh, well, for the logicians among you, they may say, oh, this looks like Hilbert, uh, a Hilbert calculus, right? And well, a little bit like this, but this is just folklore. Anyway, so these are rules, and here are some intricacy about rules. And now actually let's look a little bit more into, if you want to write aggregates, how they are really formed and how, you have to, how, you, how they are finally spelled out. Hmm. Well, actually, you may have noticed a couple of discrepancies uh, so far by looking at what Gringo offers as its input language and what we've seen before. First is that, oh, before there were all these nice cardinality constraints, right, with a lower bound, an upper bound, and then just a set of atoms. But now looking at aggregate atoms, well, there's always this aggregate um, function explicitly given, the alpha, right? And uh, even though one can omit stuff, it looks much more detailed. The other thing, when looking at the rules, aggregates could actually not appear in the head, just in the body. Well, and this is actually one thing we will now look at first. How can we remove uh, aggregates from the head back in the body? More or less with the same tricks we've seen at the beginning of this, of the, of the, of this part in the first section. Also, I'll give you more or less the ground truth. How would in full detail actually look an aggregate in the head? And on the next slide we will then see how abbreviations are then translated in, in, into these other guys. Okay, let's get started with this. So you'll see a monster now. Okay, sorry for that, but here we go. So this is a rule. Uh, let's look at the easy part with a set of literals in the body. But here there is now this complicated structure which is a full-fledged uh, aggregate. But actually, this again is not a primitive. This is, will be translated away. But then anyway, it, it, it's an important specification of what has to happen. Okay, one step at a time, as I keep saying, right? 
Anyway, so we have the lower bound and the upper bound. We have the lower and the upper uh, comparison symbol and we have the aggregate symbol and these guys are all as we've seen before. Also there is again the bold phase uh, T which actually stands for uh, a tuple of terms. And actually if you know and, and then there is the conditional literal, this is this guy and actually this tuple of terms and this conditional literals constitute together an element of this head aggregate atom. Well, two things. First of all, you may have noticed that I was dancing around when there were weights and, and there were conditions on them, so I call them weighted uh, terms. Well, actually here, this is, this is one way to deal with this. We have a term and here we have a condition on that. Just that in this condition, and somehow the upper case L and the lower case L form a single condition, so the small L and the big L must be true so that this term tuple is added to the set ultimately but this guy here is the distinguished head so more or less if this rule applies and more or less the conditions are satisfied then these guys here the ones that are, have a distinguished role that are not part of this flat uh, conjunction will be subject to being chosen right because keep in mind that's what we do also with choices in the head there's a bunch of atoms and among them we can add any subset uh, to the current stable model candidate right so this is actually why there is this distinction the aggregate the aggregate function is only applied to terms and these conditions select which terms will be in the set and then if we found a configuration of elements if we pick these elements and these elements that are between these bounds then we can choose between these atoms here and, and add them to the either, either either or not add them to the stable model candidate, right? That's the idea. And well, just to be complete, and these are just plain literals here. Okay, good. So again, this is a complex structure, but again, it will be translated away. And the cool thing is we already saw the techniques in the first section of this part. How do we remove uh, aggregates, choice rules or cardinality constraints from the head. Actually choices, plain choices, we don't eliminate, they are, they, they, we looked at them as primitives, but we've also seen how they can be compiled away. But what is the analogous is more or less when we looked at um, cardinality constraints with lower and upper bounds and how they can be compiled away. Okay, I zip it now and show you the translation. Okay, the key thing is more or less are these guys here, right? the L1 to LK and the idea is more or less you say well if the body of the rule uh, is satisfied and this is this guy and the the condition the other conditions that constitute the overall conditional literal and this for each J then you may select the literal LJ or not and add it to the or and add it or not add it to the stable model candidate right that's more or less the idea and uh, then there is again, it's the same type of translation that says it must not be the case, we have an integrity constraint here, that the body of the rule is satisfied, this is satisfied, but the aggregate atom is not satisfied. And that's it. And this model is a more compact uh, translation taking actually um, aggregates into account, but it follows more or less the same uh, compilation principles as we've seen before. Now let's look briefly at an example. So here is a rule with an aggregate atom in the head because look there's a dot and so this is actually in the head because it's a fact. And now it says well the sum of all c's and c's are costs such that cxy satisfies uh, xy and uh, cost xy uh, c. Right? If this condition is satisfied then we add the respective instantiation was the value that we get from here and for x and for x y so we have triples here then they are in the set and then we do we build the sum over the first element of the of the triples and check whether the result of taking the sum of these guys is greater than 10. okay so if you evaluate this actually so what happens is so you don't have to specify edges because they are, will be made derivable here, right? You see that? So what you need are at least you need to know whether x, y and c is true. And if this condition is true 
and you more or less got a configuration of these guys such that the cost of them is greater than 10, then the corresponding edges will be derivable. Right? That's more or less the idea. Then, of course, these edges are in the stable model, right? Because we derive them here, and here they are checked. And look, here, when they are checked, here there is a comma. And so they are checked together with the other condition. Again, keep in mind, here we have a condition, and this is the condition on the term. And this condition, there is a small l and the capital L, so more or less the, the tuple of all these conditions, or the conjunction, are checked together when evaluating the aggregate. This is how we verify that the condition imposed by the aggregate is satisfied. But by more or less distinguishing this L1 here, uh, it allows us to derive exactly these guys, provided that the, the remaining conditions and the original body is satisfied. Right? So, this is more or less how this guy works. Now, let's actually see uh, how we can look at further shortcuts, but keep in mind, uh, this is again an abbreviation and things are mapped back onto rules as we've seen them before, right? Where aggregates can only appear in the, in the body. And, well, in the, in the basic syntax of Gringo, we haven't talked about uh, choices because you, couldn't comp you could compile them away, but they are also there. Good. Now, let's see about further shortcuts. So here we are back on home ground. So we have a very cozy cardinality constraint, right? A lower bound, an upper bound, and a set of conditional literals in the set. And now depending on where such a cardinality constraint occurs, it is mapped onto a count aggregate, right? So if it appears in the head, then, uh, well, then more or less this conditional is just mapped here because these guys, the L1s, the L1 to LK uh, should be derivable. And actually, Gringo invents for you some terms that, uh, that then implement more or less the semantics of counting the literals. I will show you an example of this later on. Now, if, this, if the very same expression appears in the body of a rule, it is translated slightly different. And the slight difference is that you, instead of having, well, here we have a conditional literal. After all, you only check the condition. Here, this is put as, as one conjunction. And instead of really counting the literal, the corresponding term that is actually generated in from more or less from the information in the literal, this term is then counted, right? So, and this is it. That's the magic that is that is more or less happening. And if you really want to type everything explicitly, you have to do it in this way. Here I again gave you more of the mathematical aspects, and I didn't really write down things in 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 in, in real source code and all like this, because I think this gets a bit tedious. And these are things you better read up in the in Potasco's user's guide. And keep in mind that you can even drop these guys here, uh, one or both, and then you have, uh, you have even simpler cardinality constraints with lower or, or upper bounds. Okay, so this is about shortcuts. Let's now see a little bit more about pragmatics. Actually, I'm pretty sure that you have been wondering for quite a while why we use here when it comes to summing things up uh, tuples and why the sum only works over the first argument, right? Because somehow when you wrote a sum in mathematics, that's not really what you do, right? But it's something that really gives you modeling power. And let me illustrate this to you now. So I just made up this uh, rule here, which, well, uh, which computes the sum of the costs I've been traveling. We've been traveling, right? Let's do things together. And um, here the typical thing is that I actually use here a, 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 a triple and not just, uh, not just the cost, but you may wonder why. Okay, let's perhaps first do it in the natural way, in the way you had expected how things work. So what we do is we have, we travel from A to B and we, we, this costs three or the distance between A and B is three and between B and C the travel is also three. And now let's actually look what comes out if we take these two facts together with this rule. And again, here we only look at the costs that, that we have in, in our travel predicates. So I push the button and what we get is sum 3. So the sum of our travel is 3. So we, from A to B we have a distance of 3 and from B to C we have a distance of 3 and we get 3 as a result. Well, if we all like threes, that's okay, but I would say arithmetically it's not the right result and it's not what we, what we actually expect. But how come? Let's, let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So, 
how come? And so let's first look actually at the at just at the at the aggregate uh, atom here, and then afterwards we look what happens to the rule. Just also to concentrate a bit more on, on where things are going. So this is the uh, aggregate atom that we have up up here, and well, we have two atoms about traveling. This guy and this guy, and they are they are atoms. They are true, and hence we can right away plug them in here. And if plugging plugging in means we we ground. We ground uh, the, these guys here with all candidates here, or we and we substitute the variables with with with, with, the, with the all triplets here, and what we get is this here. Okay, so we choose we a, b, and three, and b, c, and three, and these these are these two candidates, and um, and the cost actually is then obtained here as the weight of this weighted uh, of this weighted um, weighted or conditioned weight, right? Oh, <laughs> sorry for that. Anyway, now we have these two guys and they are true. And since they are true, actually, we can replace this with true and we get three and three. Okay. But now something happens that I wouldn't say it's subtle. It's just that you, you don't think of this at the first place. This is a parenthesis and this and this indicates a set. And hence, this is the set of three and three. And since it's a set and remember, what are the properties of a set? Each element can only occur once in a set. If you if an element is already in the, in the set and you add it again, the set doesn't change. That's the same what happens here. Three and three on the set. This is three. Okay, now that we have evaluated the aggregate atom here, let's just look at the rest of the rule. Right? Well, we sum up the well, these are tuples with one element. We, we, we sum up, there is just three, the sum is three. This is instancy, we get here also a three. And then actually this all happens in Gringo, actually, uh, the Gringo, the grounder, uh, and nothing is even happening in, in the solver. So this is simplified, uh, this is simplified away, and the whole program is, the whole program, these, uh, no, not the whole program, we get this fact and this fact, and this rule here is reduced to this fact here, sum of three. That's actually why we get three. Now let's actually look what happens when we add x and y. And keep in mind, we now get here triples of elements. We take the instantiation from here, carry them over, but the sum is only built over the first element. Okay, what do we get now? We get six. Well, if you loved your threes, your threes all over the place, now you may be a bit sad, but believe me, arithmetically, this may be the preferable solution. Anyway, let's not get too chatty. And I do my usual thing, I zip it. So let's look again at the at the aggregate. Here it is. That's the guy up up here. But now actually we have here x and y added to to c as a, and form a, a more complex uh, a triple. And now we instantiate this with the two candidates here with the travels, and we get this. So now again the the, the terms that we have here, the a b and the b c, are also uh, substituted here, and these guys are. Are facts, so they are simplified, and we get a set of two triples. And let, let me stress this because I I, I, I I dropped that before. Explicitly, one could one could you could add actually parentheses, and then it would be really clear that this set has two elements, and these elements are really different, right? So this this is a triple of three AB, and this is a triple of three BC. They are different, hence they cannot be simplified away. And now the sum. Is, is taken over the first argument of each triple, which is three and three, and this is how we get then the six here, right? The sum is built over, over these guys, this is six, then also substituted here, and we get six. And this is actually a very nice uh, way of for modeling because the idea is you have always a set semantics. So this is always a set, right? And if you want to implement, and that's actually what, what, what I do here, right? A multi-set notion, I can add terms, and these are, can be arbitrary, and, and the idea is often to form them with instantiation that I have here. So if I have here the same sum as before, right, as three from AB, then the three on, on edge AB is, is more or less another one than the three on edge BC. On the other hand, if you want only to count, let's say, outgoing edges, you may drop the Y, right? Or you may drop the x if you want to model something else. So it's up to you how you model and how you count. And this is a really flexible tool once you get used to it. I agree. Once you get used to it, and when you see this for the first time, it may look a bit awkward. 
Uh, but believe me, it's 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 a real cool thing to 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 have to do model to model the, these um, sets, and not only in, in in sums, right? Also in counts or in minimize or maximize statement in a in a in a rather fine grained way. Interestingly, this is normally something where a question pops up way before in the course, and I can then explain that. And and I hope you didn't have to do too much head banging to understand this. But here it is now, and I hope not too late. Okay, one thing I, I still owe you, and I was announcing or was ending the last uh, video with now about pragmatics. How actually, how actually does Gringo generate these tuples uh, when there are count aggregates, right? And uh, let's just see that. So here I just launch Gringo, uh, and I want machine, uh, the human readable output, and the program is just a choice where of A and B. And that's a very sh simple way to do this in, 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 in Unix. And what Gringo will actually do it will generate a count aggregate of this, right? And here there is the here there are the two uh, the, the, the two atoms. Keep in mind that there is no con there is no con so A and B they are no, not they are no conditional literals, they are just literals, hence there is not a, an, another structure here at the end. So A is here, B is here, and these are the, the two term triples that are generated to do the count. And this is done in, by, by Gringo in a way that each element here has a unique, a unique uh, tuple, and hence um, you make sure that everything is counted if you only write the atoms. Okay, again, more pragmatics, and something you've already seen because you may wonder, ah, why is there a semicolon? Also, we have seen this in the in the ex expansion here of of, of 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 the of the example, right? And more than it's the same reason as we've seen before, where we had. A body is a conjunction of, of, of uh, literals, and when we use conditional literals, then we have to use semicolons instead of uh, commas, and that's the same reason here. Just look at this example, right? So here there is a set, which well, I just said cardinality should be equal one, but look at it. We want to, here, here we use a semicolon because we have to distinguish this conditional literal from this conditional literal. And somehow, in this way, we have to, we have to separate elements by semicolons, simply because here the commas are already used for the conditions. Same reason as before. Again, this is something where you may scratch your head and, oh, why did they come up with this? But the interesting thing is, I, I was telling you about the ASP language standard, right? And we were also really headbanging because the alternative had been that we introduce more parentheses here, right? That we most certainly say, oh, we leave a comma here, but then we put this into parentheses. And we didn't want that many parentheses, and this was more or less uh, our way out. Again, something for the first time you may scratch your head, but once you get used to it, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, now this is it about aggregates. Now to make the whole thing uh, complete, let's look at something you've already seen. So, curious? So stay tuned. Or tune.